Um, so we'll go ahead and get started since it's 9 o'clock. Um, my name's Katie Klein-Hesslink. I'm the Director of Member Services for Colorado Campus Compact. Are folks here familiar with Campus Compact? By a show of hands, perhaps? Okay, so about half the folks in the room. Um, Colorado Campus Compact is a membership organization of um, colleges and universities in our state that are devoted to the public good. It's a presidential membership organization. Um, and my role there is to work primarily on faculty development initiatives. And most recently, that's sort of taken the frame of working toward community-engaged scholarship, which is what I'll be talking about today. Here's what we're going to hope to accomplish this morning. Um, first, we're going to work to define community-engaged scholarship. Um, second, we'll investigate some best practices for working with community. Third, we're going to do some assessment around individual readiness to pursue community-engaged scholarship. And then lastly, we'll explore some resources to support community-engaged scholarship. So um, today we are talking about, I mean, I, I, I will add the caveat that this is going to be pretty higher ed focused, um, So, but there's probably some intersection really around community partnership that, partnership that may be relevant for, for other folks as well. So feel free to stop me at any time if you um, have questions, comments, need clarification, et cetera. Um, so the context from which I'm working in this um, presentation um, really is around a movement that's um, gotten some traction in the past couple of years. Um, and there are two documents that I'll be, that I'll reference now. The first being a crucible moment, which at our networking breakfast this morning we discussed. And this is a document that was requested by the U.S. Department of Education um, from the American Association of Colleges and Universities on the state of civic learning um, and civic mindedness among students um, at American college campuses. And what they found is that we're really in the middle of a civic recession, that students aren't graduating with the skills and knowledge that they need to participate fully in democracy. And so one of the findings of this report or the calls to action was that we really need to create civic-minded campuses. And that goes beyond volunteerism or teaching service learning classes, but that we really need to embed engagement in all aspects of the institution. And so I'll be talking about community-engaged scholarship in that framework. The second document um, is a book that came out last year called To Serve a Larger Purpose by Saltmarsh and Hartley. Um, and John Saltmarsh heads up the Carnegie uh, Classification for Community Engagement process for colleges and universities. And this was a pretty harsh indictment of, um, very, very direct indictment of higher education's commitment to engagement and how the feeling of the authors is that we have American education was founded, higher education was founded on the principle of advancing the public good and educating folks for democracy. And in fact, we still talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. And so asking institutions to really recommit to that original charge um, for higher education. So community engaged scholarship, we think at Compact, is a, is a really great way to, to help reorient toward that charge because we believe in our work with faculty that by educating faculty and empowering them to pursue this kind of work, we create critical masses on campus that can actually advance change at their institutions. So some of the benefits that we know for faculty who pursue community-engaged scholarship, um, they report a higher satisfaction with the quality of stu student learning in their courses. They also commit, um, report a deeper commitment to research. And in fact, I found this um, quote very interesting because um, a lot of folks shy away from community-engaged research based on funding issues, et cetera. But in fact, Checkaway found in 2001 that faculty who engage in significant community co consultation score higher in the number of funded research projects, in the number of professional peer-reviewed publications, and in their student evaluations than faculty who do not. So there are some very tangible benefits um, in that regard. And in terms of the institutional implications, first and foremost, given what we talked about with Crucible Moment and um, 
to serve a higher purpose, um, this kind of work does fulfill that, that mission of higher education to help promote the public good. Institutions where community-engaged research and service is embedded report an enhanced relationship with the community, increased retention among their students, um, and it has very tangible um, benefits in terms of the accreditation process. Here in um, this region, we um, are accredited through the Higher Learning Commission, and so it's a very tangible way to meet Criterion 5 for engagement and service. And lastly, a research study by Weirtz and Salmon um, found that during the 90s, and this is very significant, um, I think across the states, but here in Colorado, where public funding is constantly being slashed for higher education, that increased public engagement was positively associated with increased levels of state appropriations for public research universities during the 90s. So we're gonna move into some definitions so that we're all clear on what we're talking about when we talk about community-engaged scholarship because there's been some evolution in terminology versus the scholarship of engagement versus engaged scholarship, et cetera. So we're gonna go through some terms. First of all, community engagement um, is the application of institutional resources to address and solve challenges in the community through collaborations with the community. So this, this differs pretty significantly from outreach, for example, which is a one-way street. Re if we're talking about engagement, we're talking about reciprocal partnerships in which the community has equal input to the institution in terms of solving the challenges at hand. And when we talk about scholarship, now, generally, in the past, we know that, I mean, and, and this is true of me as well, when I think of scholarship, I think of research. I think of very cut and dried research. And in fact, Ernest Boyer, um, in the 90s, wrote a, a really a fundamental, an article that really fundamentally changed the way a lot of colleges and universities view scholarship, and you'll see this in tenure and promotion practices. But the scholarship of discovery is what we talk about when we talk about classic research, but he identified three other um, kinds of scholarship that he felt should be equally viewed in the tenure and promotion process and in terms of institutionalizing this work. The first being integration, and this is really probably um, the least represented um, today, but integration is making connections across disciplines, so this, this could be um, like meta-analysis of research in the field. This could be um, creating cross-disciplinary courses, for example. Second, the scholarship of application. The scholarship of application is also commonly known as the scholarship of engagement, and I intentionally did not put it as the scholarship of engagement because it, it can be confusing. But the scholarship of application asks how we can apply knowledge to the social issues in the community to make change. But what it doesn't say, and this is why it differs from community engagement, is that that has to be done in consultation with the community. So this, this in some respects, harkens back to a more patriarchal version if we're not talking about real community engagement within this process. So this might be policy analysis, this might be um, going in and doing a program evaluation and assessment with a nonprofit, it's most commonly associated with the service category in um, the tenure and promotion process. And finally, the scholarship of teaching, which is not only teaching, but transforming and extending that. So that includes um, publishing on teaching, documenting best practices um, around teaching in your field, that, that sort of thing. In order to be considered scholarship, and you'll see this um, in a lot of tenure and promotion practices across uh, universities in the United States, these are, this tends to be how scholarship ends up being evaluated. Um, the activity requires a high level of expertise, is innovative, has significance or impact, can be replicated that, and elaborated, that it's documented and disseminated, and that the work and its results are peer reviewed. This has been the standard for a very, a very long time. But community engaged scholarship is all of the things that we just talked about. However, it involves the scholar in a mutually beneficial partnership with the community. 
So for those of us, I mean, does that resonate when we think about scholarship at our institutions? Does, do you see any difference or similarities in how scholarship is defined in the work that you do? No? All right, it's standard. But. So this is a graphic from uh, Campus Community Partnerships for Health, and this is a wonderful organization that has more resources than you can count on how to enact community-engaged scholarship. They are really at the forefront of this work. I admire a, a great deal, if not all, of what they do. And this is just for our visual learners, the, you know, the idea that regardless of the scholarship activity, it, you know, it, it can be community engaged or, or it cannot, but that it, um, it spans the spectrum here. So the characteristics, characteristics of quality community engaged scholarship, and we're seeing this now adopted at more and more universities in terms of tenure and promotion practices so that this can actually advance um, the careers of our instructors and professors at different institutions. These are, these are very clear. You'll just see that we, we have the addition of community in there. So the project has clear goals for both, that are both academic and community-based. It required adequate pr preparation, both in the content area, in the field, and within the community. It employed methodological rigor. It has significance in the field. It advances the knowledge of the field and knowledge within the community. There's effective presentation. It's been disseminated not just among academic journals where it stays in-house and siloed, but it's disseminated back in the community so that new knowledge and new skill can actually be transferred and used by the community to make change. It involves reflective critique. The scholar learns from the process and is able to apply that to future scholarship and that it employed ethical behavior. And this comes from an article by uh, Jordan Wong and Jung Nichol out of the August 2009 Metropolitan University's journal. If you're interested in community-engaged scholarship at all, I recommend picking up a copy of this particular edition. It's entirely devoted to community-engaged scholarship and what we can do to institutionalize it at our universities and colleges and move the needle. Um, on creating cultures that support that. So I'm going to move now into working with community. Um, does anyone have any questions at this time? Great. OK, so we are, we're going to do some work here around partnerships. And so, as I mentioned, in order to engage in community-engaged scholarship, it really requires a reciprocal partnership as the basis of that experience with a community organization, with a demographic within the community. It depends on the project. But it should have mutually beneficial outcomes, so it should advance um, the aims of the scholar involved. If there are students involved, it should reflect um, benefits for them as well, as well as equal benefits for the community. Um, the project should be approached from a place of dialogue, acknowledging that the university doesn't own the knowledge and the skills, that in fact there's knowledge and skills in the community that is of equal value, um, and that there's reciprocity, that it, the, the, project, the project's outcome enhances community capacity as well as the scholarship um, of the faculty member involved um, or student learning. And um, the other day as I was preparing for this presentation, I was thinking about um, examples of where this has worked and gone wrong, and I happened to be reading um, the New York Times. Did anybody see the article? Um, it was called, Minority Groups and Bottlers Team Up in Battles Over Soda. Did you happen to see that? Okay. Are you familiar with the soda ban in New York City, the large sugary drinks? Okay. So what this article talked about is how minority groups, small business associations, um, and um, health advocacy organizations all teamed up with soda bottlers to defeat that, that order that they, that they as a group took back to court. And at first that seemed really counterintuitive to me, like why, like, I mean, sugary, I mean, it's, it's bad for you, diabetes, obesity, right? Well, as it turns out, um, a quote um, that I heard is that this practice is 
discriminatory and paternalistic. The community was not consulted in the creation of this policy. And in fact, the soda bottlers fund a lot of the work of several of these associations. They fund financial literacy classes in the neighborhoods that are most affected. They give dollars to um, the advancement of um, the Hispanic Institute that's in New York City. So there are real relationships there that the city didn't take into consideration when they, when they proposed this ban. And in fact, the way that they structured it adversely impacted um, small um, neighborhoods, primarily of African American and um, Latino descent. And so these groups teamed up and were like, no way. I mean, this is, you can't, you can't tell us what we can and can't drink, right? Because they weren't involved in, in the process of creating this ban. And I have a quote here from um, Jose Calderon from the Hispanic Federation that says, you don't move the needle by legislating what people ultimately eat and drink. You educate folks, you empower folks, and meet them where they are, basically. And that really resonated with me as I was preparing this, this presentation because that's, it's a perfect example of what happens when you go in with a I know better than you attitude. Then. So I just thought it was rather timely. So in terms of what a successful partnership looks like over time, um, and we'll talk about motivation here more in a minute, but when you're working with a community partner, um, it's a bit of a dating process, right? I mean, you want to you wanna make sure that your, your self-interest and their self-interest have something in, in common, that there's a shared worldview, that you have agreement on goals and strategies, and that you can foster a relationship um, that's based on trust and respect. And over time, we get to a place of shared power and that's fostered through clear communication and careful listening. And that it's flexible. I mean, needs change. I mean, communities change. I mean, agendas change over time so that you have enough trust in this relationship to accommodate the bumps in the road, right? And then the outcome of that partnership would be, you know, that the needs and interests are met, yes. Um, that the organizational capacities, and I would argue individual capacities as well, as all the partners are increased and enhanced. And that there's a shared long-term perspective on change. And I would add that there's an opportunity for future collaboration to keep deepening that, that partnership. So we're going to talk here um, about self-interest. And we're lucky we have um, Cara Diano in the room, who is um, a guru on community organizing. And this is a fundamental tenet of community organizing, but it's very valuable in terms of how you approach partnerships to make sure that you're really engaging in a reciprocal partnership. So self-interest is essentially the, the sweet spot between selflessness, where you're doing everything for someone else, that selflessness, you know, no boundaries, that, and selfishness, where you're operating from a place of greed and you're not able to take into account the needs of others. And so um, as you consider partnerships, the first thing that you have to do before you ever go into community is know where you're operating from, what your values are. Great. We're, well, we'll move into now the competencies for community-engaged scholarship. And for those of you that are um, service learning directors, um, for example, this. The tool that we'll go through in a minute may be something that you can use and share um, with your faculty um, or use yourself. One thing to note on community engaged scholarship, and as I'm going to talk about these competencies, is that it doesn't matter. We'll be using terms like novice to expert. That has nothing to do with where a person is at in their career. People come into community engaged scholarship at all different points, we may be talking about a brand new instructor, someone that's been tenured for, for years. So those terms don't apply to necessarily time, time on the ground. Right. So um, this comes out of, again, uh, this, this article is from the Metropolitan University's 
journal, um, models for faculty development, what does it take to be a community engaged scholar. So this is a great resource um, and it's in the uh, references page on the presentation. But CCPH again also has um, a community engaged scholar toolkit that I would recommend looking at if you're interested in this work that has a whole other rubric uh, for how to assess yourself and what your readiness for community engaged scholarship. Um, so basically, um, someone first entering um, this work, um, a novice would be able to approach this um, having, you know, understanding the basic concepts of community engagement and community engaged scholarship. So sort of the basic framework that we've talked about today, Familiar familiarity with the basic literature and history of community engaged scholarships. So you should probably read up on Boyer, for example, or Salt Marsh. Um, understands the various contributors to community issues. So this doesn't mean broadly, this necessarily means in the community within um, which you hope to do and with which you hope to do your work. Um, and that you have a willingness to develop um, the skills and commitment for fostering community and social change. So this is someone on the very entry point of um, pursuing a community engaged scholarship agenda. Moving through to intermediate, um, knowledge of and skills in applying the principles of community engaged scholarship in both theory and practice. So this is no longer that theoretical base, like I think I understand what the issues that are contributing to the problem. This is um, understanding how to design the models and methods for planning with the community and how to implement and evaluate the project itself. So really having a bit of the strength to get behind what you want to do and actually get out in the, with the community and start doing it. An intermediate community engaged scholar can work effectively in and with diverse communities, can negotiate, this is a huge one, negotiate across community and academic groups. I mean, we know that there are silos that exist within higher education and that a lot of, you know, we historically universities tend to go and work in the community, do what they need to do, and then they pull back out and that information is just disseminated within the academic group. This is, this is breaking that up so that, I mean, you actually know how to do that cross communication so that both the university and the community are benefiting. This person can write grants um, that get funded, <laughs> that express the principles of community engaged scholarship um, and the approaches. And they can also write articles based on these processes for peer reviewed publications. One of the issues with community engaged scholarship, and we'll talk about challenges in a minute, but the outcomes of community engaged scholarship are not always, and in fact are, I mean not even not always, are, are often not peer reviewed publications. That's not the the community, as you're collaborating, them doesn't necessarily need an, an article to be published in a journal somewhere. They need a, a product that may be a program evaluation or um, a collection of um, oral histories that's then shared back with the community. And so this, um, this is a big deal for faculty because they can't necessarily count that toward tenure and promotion practice it, and so it's, it's a hindrance. So it's something that, that we need to, to acknowledge. But the ability, the more folks can write and get published on it, the more legitimate this work becomes in the eyes of the institution. Intermediate to advanced, um, the faculty has the ability to transfer skills to the community and other faculty, so they can actually be a catalyst for change at their institution in terms of training other faculty and how to do this work, in terms of advocating for change in tenure and promotion practices, assuming leadership roles within the university where they can affect change a little more. And they can understand and apply the definitions of community engaged scholarship, define the products, the outcomes, et cetera. Oops, I don't know if I know how to get back. Well, I'll just look at my notes. This just goes to show how technologically inept I am. 
Um, but finally, an advanced practitioner understands the policy implications of community-engaged scholarship and can actually help the community act on those policies so they can work in tandem, not just to produce a product, but actually affect change in the community, deepening that partnership so that we're actually moving the needle and getting to root causes of issues and trying to chip away at them. Um, and that person then also has the ability in terms of shifting institutional culture to sit on promotion and tenure committees, for example, make sure, bring in faculty that know how to practice this work, and ultimately create that critical mass that I talked about way at the beginning of faculty that can actually move their department, move the institution in a way that we create an engaged campus culture. So I did want to, um, and I've touched on this a bit, but um, you know there are some significant challenges for faculty in pursuing this work, and so I just wanted to acknowledge um, those. Um, the first being, as we just talked about, there are very few professional development opportunities available to faculty to pursue this work, and that's true. Uh, that's true across the board. Um, in terms of their promotion process, it's very difficult to identify peer reviewers who are familiar enough with community-engaged scholarship to actually review. Um, the methods for peer review and publication and dissemination of non-journal products are limited. I mean, as I mentioned, I mean, the products of community-engaged scholarship are not necessarily journal articles, so how then do we go through that same vetting process with those products to make sure that they classify as scholarship. Um, community partner roles, um, you know, in this work, as we've said again and again, I mean, this is all founded in a reciprocal community partnership where a community partner is invested in the creation of the research question, if it's a research project, the actual implementation of the project, the dissemination of the work. However, when it comes to reviewing that work, community partners are not invited into that process, for instance, on tenure and promotion um, committees. And so that is a real issue that, that they are inevitably excluded at, at critical moments. And of course, also the institutional culture, particularly with our research universities that really privilege the scholarship of, of discovery and the tenure and promotion process really talks about there are very specific journals that you have to publish in in order to get tenure and they don't entertain the notion of journals that are more dedicated to community engagement work, et cetera. So I just want to honor this because it, um, because it is, a, it is a real hindrance and it takes some, um, it, it takes some real passion and dedication and knowing that, you know, you, you're going to have to work not just in your community but in your institution to try to shift culture to get this work acknowledged um, and recognized. Well, I can talk a little bit about some projects that we've funded out of our office um, that, that offer some examples of, of both um, projects that have regard, um, resulted in journal publications or they're out for publication right now and then diverse products. For example, we have a um, faculty member at Colorado State University Pueblo who submitted a project, and I butcher this every time because I'm not a science project, person, but his project um, was working with a grad student with the, and Stephanie is laughing, Stephanie's my boss, just so everyone knows, but um, this project involved studying um, the polymers in biosolids, so the human waste that comes out of um, the solid waste insta, like, I want to call it a factory, it's not a factory, it's a department of <laughs> the human waste factory, but studying those because that is used as fertilizer for human food and heavy chemical and metals and whatnot are deposited into our food and then grown into the plants and it affects human health. So his project was studying the prevalence of those polymers that were being spread as fertilizer to help give recommendations back to the solid waste department on what they can do to get rid of those before it's applied as fertilizer. So what resulted from that project was a journal article, yes, for him, but also a 
protocol for the solid waste department that actually then um, helped become policy that they can use with other solid waste departments across the United States. So it had some very broad implications um, out of that project. Another would be, um, and I don't believe she's, she's written on this yet, but at DU, um, one of Kara's colleagues, Anne de Prince, is a psychology professor who has a class, a research methods class, and what they're doing is working um, with um, survivors of domestic human trafficking and developing a protocol for the DA office um, to work with those survivors and help them navigate the court system. So they're doing interviews with survivors and then giving that product back to the DA so that they know how to ethically and responsibly responsibly communicate with um, survivors of this trauma. So it has real implications for the community and it's a product that the DA can use, but it's also an opportunity for, for Anne, if she so chooses to publish on the scholarship of teaching and learning using the research process with her students as well as through her work on trauma in the psychology discipline overall. So those are some examples of how I mean, it can, results can be traditional scholarship products, but also community-based products that maybe don't have the recognition yet within our universities, but are extremely important community outcomes that we should, in my view, acknowledge um, and support. Um, so I was just gonna talk briefly about um, tenure and promotion portfolios because one of the things that we talk about like in service learning offices for example we provide the resources for faculty to develop courses but we don't necessarily because we're not doing the training around community engaged scholarship ask them to intentionally think about how doing service learning may tie into a research interest of theirs or they can strategically develop partnerships for a service learning class that also work for um, a research project um, or a potential site for them to do professional service, et cetera. So when faculty, if faculty approach you, I mean particularly for those of you in service learning offices, um, about doing this work, particularly if they're tenure track, these are just some tips um, as they consider moving into this frame because the more they can do up front um, in terms of what they propose in their tenure and promotion package, the easier it is to keep their committee accountable later on to what they agreed on in the beginning. So their work should always be grounded in the department and institution mission. And this is a really easy one for community engaged scholarship because oftentimes if we look at our university and college missions, they are tied in some way to the, to the public good. Um, obviously, the narrative is framed around the local TMP criteria. There's an integrated and compelling story that uses lots of evidence. And even though we, we tend to privilege quantitative information, that there are qualitative examples of, um, of the work that they're doing, that it intentionally reflects the qualities of community-engaged scholarship, which we reviewed back at the beginning, which really, when you look at it, are almost exactly the same as traditional scholarship with the caveat that the community is, is involved throughout that, that process and that it illustrates sustained reciprocal partnerships. So across teaching, research, and service, they're working with the same community partners, deepening those relationships in a way that they can actually um, implement and help affect change. And all of this is in this community engaged scholarship toolkit. I've referenced it a couple times. It's it's absolutely amazing. And if you work with faculty or you're a faculty member yourself, it can be very instructional in how to be super intentional about getting your work recognized. Um, exemplary portfolios, regardless um, of, of whether they're community engaged or not, integrate the scholarship of discovery and teaching but in this case through engagement, demonstrate rigor and impact. Engagement is woven throughout the story. Um, 
and that there are strong letters of support from both inside and outside the discipline and for community engaged work those letters of support should definitely include letters from community partners and community members affected by the work of the scholar and that it's cross-referenced and easy to navigate. So I won't spend too much time here, but for those of you who do faculty support, I would really recommend um, checking out this, this tool. Um, lastly, I'm just gonna um, talk to you about a few resources and I've included these in your packet for you. Um, but if you're pursuing community-engaged scholarship yourself or you um, work with faculty who are, for the tenure and promotion process, the National Review Board for the Scholarship of Engagement um, is a review mechanism for faculty seeking promotion based on community-engaged scholarship. They can um, hook faculty up with outside reviewers who are familiar with community-engaged scholarship to help strengthen their committee. Um, the Community Engaged Scholarship Review um, Promotion and Tenure Package is again part of CCPH's work and it has sample community engaged portfolios that um, faculty can reference as they work on their own portfolio. There's the Engaged Campus Initiative that comes um, out of Campus Compact, our national organization. It's just compact.org. It's also in your Folder, um, but there's a webinar series that's going on right now that talks about several different aspects of engaged campus work, including things like bridging academic and student affairs, how to work with social entrepreneurs, all kinds of interesting stuff. There's a diving deep institute that Compaq hosts for advanced practitioners. We don't see a lot of training for advanced practitioners. A lot of stuff is intro work, so this is an opportunity for folks to really get into some high-level thinking about this work. Engaged Department Toolkit um, as well talks about creating um, culture within individual departments and reframing tenure and promotion practices. If you're in a state with a compact, 35 states have um, state campus compacts, they are probably working on this initiative. This is a national movement, and so it's, it would be a great resource for you to connect with. CES for Health is a new um, program out of Campus Community Partnerships for Health. It's a, actually a peer-reviewed mechanism for the products of community-engaged scholarship that are not traditional journal articles. I recommend just going on there and taking a look. You can sign up to be a reviewer yourself um, as a community member, a faculty member, um, higher education staff, and it's also a great um, clearinghouse for those products. They're all available for download, and so they're really neat community-based projects, videos, oral histories, I, the, they run the gamut. Uh, it's, it's a really cool site, but it's, it uses all the same criteria as traditional journal reviews, and so it's really working intentionally to have this work recognized um, on the same level as journal articles for tenure and promotion processes. FacultyDatabase.info, um, these are community engaged faculty who are willing to serve as mentors for your faculty who are pursuing community engaged work um, or as portfolio reviewers. Um, department chairs can use this to match um, faculty. Uh, and they, they're all across the nation and, and these are folks that have signed up and are willing um, to provide that service to other faculty who are new to this process.